just got to start with tuning. I know I should probably tune before I start streaming, but I was running late. Morning. fingers. Sam, you're the first one on this morning. Bob, good to see you. Question, Sam, do you think Michigan would have done better against Georgia than TCU did? Hey, Joseph, good morning. Hey, Dennis. Guten Morgen, actually. Uh, guten Avon, right? Avon. Guten Avon? I need to know this. Good evening. <laughs> hey, Brian, what's good? Good to see you. Wendy, what's going on? starting to sign in oh you think Michigan could have beat playing games the Michigan and the Ohio State games were great games well I didn't see either one of them I just forget that they're even on <laughs> so, and I didn't see the final one but that was no no miss 65 to 7 really it's key a little bit cold and oh you know I've got the heater in here I can turn that on and shut the door here. Mm. All right, hold on, Cindy. <clears throat> so, I'm going to continue talking about chord embellishments, fills, and riffs. <laughs> you can see that right, uh, right here. Let's see. <laughs> down, down there, down there. Uh, let's see who else is in here. Let's see, I said hi. To, oh, hey, Bruce. I almost expected a text from you. You text me. I was running late. Uh, I've, I've, we're going to have a guest later at the end of the live stream. Um, uh, and uh, I've got, I'm working for him today and he's coming by a little early. So um, we were, I was prepping the sessions 
for um, uh, for our sessions today. We've got a couple TV episodes that um, we're um, adding guitars to, and I don't know what else. Guitars, basses, I don't know. Mandolin, who knows? Like my, <laughs> I haven't had jeans like this since I was like in college. I don't know why I still kept these. But... Um, put the coffee on, Wendy. You're gonna need it. We'll have a sipping, sipping fest. This is a new guitar for me. Uh, this is a 25th anniversary uh, Taylor. Yep, 25th XXVGA. It's beautiful. Um, I'm gonna get it set up a little bit, I think. Um, but uh, it's so the action's a tad high. I've got heavy up, heavy strings on it, so um, I may. Yeah, well, Dennis, it's bedtime where you are, so you probably shouldn't have coffee. <laughs> I know I can't have coffee past three o'clock. I mean, I'll sometimes this will last me till one or two. I'll, I'll walk over, I'll see the coffee cup, I'll go, oh, and I pick it up, and it's like two o'clock in the afternoon. I go, oh, I still have like a quarter of a cup, and then I regret it later that night when it's like two in the morning, I'm wide awake. So it's got to be careful sometimes. Uh, the model is a, a GA model. Um, it's it, XXVGA is the model number. Um, XXVGA. Um, yeah, it's it's um, kind of a, a, a slightly smaller body. I think slightly narrower body too. The body feels a little narrower than a full dreadnought. Um, it's, it's got a nice tight feel. I got heavy strings on it, like I said. Thank you, Bruce. Named for his dad was friends and loved jazz. His dad was friends with Stan Kenton, so he named his son Kenton. And Kenton's about, Kent was, is about two years older than me. Maybe three? Sometimes he watches, I believe. Um, sometimes I think he watches the live stream. Um, he, uh, he's got a very aggressive, well, yeah, a fairly aggressive form of cancer. Um, poor guy, he's got like these giant tumors all over his body. You can feel them. I mean, they're sticking out. It's kind of like somewhere between a baseball and a, uh, and a golf ball. Hard as rocks, you know, in his shoulders, in his neck, actually Cracked a vertebra in his neck. Uh, he has, you know, has him uh, in his on his back, his torso, um, and he really wanted me to have his Taylor guitar. So I flew out. I'm going to fly out again in a, in a in a week or two just to hang out. We had a great time, just great time reminiscing. You know, it's so funny because I don't really see many of my cousins on either side of my family, and uh, there's very few people that I can talk about my grandparents with because. Uh, you know, I mean that that actually know my grand knew my grandparents. You know what I mean? So it's like if, if that family thing. When you move, when you move two thousand miles away from your home, uh, you you tend to move. You you tend to to cut off a lot of contacts, and that's what I did back when I was twenty one. I moved from the Midwest to California, and um, you know, really don't have any. I have a couple friends from high school that I still keep in touch with, and Facebook has helped with that, but. Um, you know, some, you know, some people, they live in the same town their whole lives. They still go out, go out for drinks with their high school friends in their sixties, you know? <laughs> and so I, you know, part of me envies that part of me doesn't envy that. Um, but I, I, uh, it was really fun hanging out with Kent Leslie and talking to him about our grandparents and memories they had versus memories I had. And. She had a bunch of uh, uh, recipes. That one recipe was my my dad came up with. I never knew about. He, he created a barbecue sauce, so I have that recipe now, so I can make my dad's barbecue sauce, which is really cool. 
Um, and then <laughs> watch it be awful. I'll be like, oh, this is the worst barbecue sauce. <laughs> but I don't know. I'm going to make it. The boys are excited about, about it, too. They want to make it, too. And they, uh, the boys remember my dad. I mean, my dad passed away, in, let's see, the year I turned 50. So that would have been... Uh, 2011 and so Jack and Alex were you know teenagers then so they remember my dad they definitely remember my mom because she moved in with us um, and uh, lived in the, in the apartment building in Pasadena with us so but um, so Kent wanted me to have his tailor and this is just it's a beautiful I mean look at the wood look at that wood isn't that gorgeous I'm not even sure it's like a curly mahogany is that a thing I don't it's just gorgeous wood. Um, the top is probably spruce. If I, you know, I, I, uh, I saw one up on Reverb. Let me see if they gave the description because that, that would make sense. Um, let's see. It was XXVGA. XXVGA. Oops. GA. There it is. 99. This one says 2000. Bob, Bob, uh, uh, is this an exit? Oh, it is. Okay. Sitka spruce quilted uh, sapel. How do you say that? Sapel? Quilted sapel. Grand Auditorium Natural with Caramel Stain back inside. Yeah. It's really, uh, let's see if this one's the same. Yep. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous instrument. And it sounds great. You know, it's funny because I've been wanting a, a guitar that had a, had, had a good sound. It's, you know, most tailors... I've said this for a long time, like on a, as my ears got better, because I didn't get my first acoustic till I was 30 years old. As my ears got better, I started to recognize acoustics on records. I started going, oh, that's a Gibson, or that's a Martin, or that's a Taylor. You know, Taylor, not so common, especially not back in the 50s or 60s and 70s. They didn't exist. Um, so you don't really hear Taylors so much, but you can, you, can go, you can sometimes hear a guitar and go, oh, that sounds like a Gibson, or that sounds like a... Martin. But for me, it's, I can always tell a Gibson, a Martin is just like, if I don't know what it is, it's probably a Martin because it's the most, it was the most common guitar, uh, back in the fifties and sixties, acoustic wise. And, oh, they made some heinous looking, look up Martin electric guitars there. Alex and I were looking them up the other day. I forgot. Cause I, I used to work in a store and we sold them and they were, they had the ugliest headstock you'd ever want to see. Just heinous. Um, but Oh, oh, pin the Discord link. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Oh, so the Discord link is kind of where everybody goes to hang out afterwards, before, during. I don't know. Here's, it's an invite link. It should work um, if you have a, a Discord account. Let me post this. Sorry, Bruce. Pin message. Okay. So it should be at the top now. A lot of people have today off. It's uh, Martin Luther King Day. <laughs> was the TCU Michigan game that was in Arizona right that was in Phoenix and Kent and Leslie went to that game they were at that game and then when TCU got to the finals they were asked uh, his his uh, fraternity brothers asked him if he wanted to go to the game in LA at SoFi and uh, he you know didn't really feel up to to going and he's <laughs> so glad he didn't <laughs> watch the game and it was raining here um and they said it was just like awful. They said that people were waiting three. Well, they, he said his friends were waiting three hours for an Uber after the game outside in the rain at SoFi. It's just like, oh my gosh, horrible. Yeah, everybody, everyone I know that's been to SoFi has just said the stadium is beautiful, but the experience is awful because it's, it's, they have no. They, the parking is limited. It's eighty dollars for anybody can get a spot, and then it's just it's just not good. But in fact, uh, Pee Wee and Michiko from my church were just there for the for a char the Chargers Rams game, I think, because Judith was singing the national anthem. Or 
So, you know, whenever somebody sings a national anthem, they get to bring their friends. So, anyway, I'm going to probably, yeah, this guitar, I'm going to have this guitar uh, probably set up by my guy. Um, and maybe it's going to be my kind of my main uh, sight reading guitar for, for sessions because I think it has a really nice solid, solid tone. I'm not hearing any rattles. My, my, even though I've had my Martin worked on, I still hear rattles every now and then. And like I said, this doesn't sound like totally like a Taylor. It's, it almost has a gift of uh, Martin quality to it, especially with the heavier strings. And I've got elixirs on here, uh, nano, nano web. So they barely have any coating on them at all. I mean, you can still hear like the squeak. If you had the poly web, it, it wouldn't squeak so much which I like not having to squeak. I just pulled out polywebs because I think that, or nanowebs, because I think that was the only ones I have in 13s. So the high string is a 13, but I, I think I'll order some polywebs in 13s because uh, I do like, even though it's a, they're a little bit softer sounding, they're not quite as bright, uh, they, this kind of thing is not there. And that's really nice when you're, squeaks <laughs> um, but yeah so that's it so then we're going to talk some more about chord embellishments fills and riffs um, and one of the things that we we I talk about all the time and we're gonna have a guest later okay so just so you know somebody's showing up um, I, I got to do some work I've been insanely busy uh, since Thanksgiving it's been busy and it's gonna be busy I pretty much know I'm gonna be busy probably till the end of April uh, and then I don't know <laughs> it's, it's just kind of get busier after that which is good when you're a freelance person, when you're self-employed, busy means uh, the bills are paid. So that's good. Hey, Brian, good to see you. David S., good to see you. Leo, what's going on? Um, Sadie, I saw you. Let's see who else. Am I missing anybody? Um, but when we talked a lot about the cage method and just a reminder, okay, um, if you're like, I, I feel like I teach it fairly excessively. Um, a lot of times when people hear the cage method, their eyes kind of glaze over, you know, like, uh, I'm going to see if I can tilt this camera up a little bit. Is that better? A little bit better. Can you see my hair? <laughs> um, and, but CAGED just stands, how do you spell CAGED? C-A-G-E-D. It stands for the five main open chords, right? Um, we have, oh, no, don't know who this is. Why, why does someone randomly say, text you, hi? Let me turn off my, let me go to, oh, I can't go to focus. I have to leave this on because Jim's going to. Our guest is going to um, text me or, well, he'll ring the doorbell. I'll have to get up and answer the door. <laughs> so sorry about that. But that's not for an hour or so. Um, hey, hey, bra ba 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 Oh, I was going to talk about the TCU game. Uh, they Well, they didn't go, oh, they went to the, the Michigan one, but they didn't go to the, the uh, final. Okay, anyway. So the cage method, C-A-G-E-D, those are the five main open chords. When you learn chords, you you know you learn C, and then you probably learn A, and you probably learn G for sure. Learn G. You probably learn E minor before you learn E major, but E would be the E in caged, and then D would be the D in caged. And everybody learns D early on. Okay, so those are the those are the five. You can even play through them in that order if you want. Doesn't really have anything to do with anything except that's the order that they peer as you go up the fretboard, okay? Now you're like, what do you mean? Well, so here's C, right? The next chord in the key, uh, the key, sorry, the next chord in the caged method would be A, and so the that would be this, but the next, if you were to move that up to C, that would be the next C chord, if you were moving up the neck. And the next C chord would be shaped like a G chord. And the next C chord would be shaped like an E chord. And the next C chord would be shaped like a D chord. 
So those familiar shapes, while those are all difficult to play, right? This is easy for the most part. This is difficult, this is very difficult, this is moderately difficult, and this is pretty difficult. But all those shapes, those very familiar shapes are up and down the fretboard. And so if you're, if you're familiar with an A chord and maybe know a lick over A like that, that would also work over C. Okay, so basically I arrived at that lick by either visualizing this A form C chord. A form is the shape, C chord is what it actually is. Or I, the G form C chord, which is right here, because that's. So when you play C, if you want to play that in C, you just use the G shape, um, the G the G form in the key of C, which would be at the fifth fret. Now you don't have to be able to play this chord, but you, okay. So that that goes for any any little riff that you any any kind of lick you do with any of those five chords can be can be transposed up the fretboard to the other chords like this you can do a G or if you want to do it in the key of A basically that same thing where I'm hammering on that third. Go to the key of C, I'm going to do the E form. So it's it's a natural thing. It's a very natural thing to do over the E chord, over the E form. And yeah, that's a little bit of a I got heavy strings and my, my, the action is a little high right now. I'm going to get that adjusted. A little difficult on electric. It's fairly simple. Um, you have to have the bar chord down, but you don't have to do the whole chord. I'm not. So let's just do that. Let's do that. So I'm going to bar the top three strings at the third fret. And that's a little G minor chord, but I'm going to hammer on that that B note at the, at the fourth fret of the third string. So I'm going B flat to B, and now it turns it into a G major triad. Very bluesy thing. Okay, just hit that. And then now hit the next two strings. Just kind of, that's just, you know, you could put a sixth on there. Seventh. Or the put the ninth on top, or the, or the flat, or the sharp nine. <laughs> you can do all sorts of things, but the, it's like because you can't really get that. You have that open B string. You can't really get to that. You could do. You could do that <laughs> if you want to get that B flat. Okay. The other thing you could, you could do that too. Kind of fun with a B-flat against the B's open string. Hey, Rory Price, what's going on? Bit confusing for me, sorry. Here's the thing. Here's the thing, Rory. Um, <laughs> when, I, when I was getting into guitar, I think at 13 or 14, I subscribed to Guitar Player Magazine because I wanted to be a guitar player. I read, I read that thing cover to cover and literally understood about 10% of it. The next month I read it cover to cover and understood about 11% of it. Uh, the next month I read it cover to cover and understood about 12 and a half percent. You see where I'm going here. Um, I restate things so many times, maybe to the frustration of some, but I also try to restate things coming from different directions because, you know, there, what, there are five ways people learn and I'm kind of a kind of a deconstruct, reconstruct or for me, the best way for me to learn something. Let's say I've got a, uh, a new scale I'm trying to learn, like some maybe like, a, you know, 
like some kind of jazz scale, like a, a, a what is that? That's the uh, Lydian dominant scale. Well, what I'll do instead of just sitting down, sitting down and practicing a million scales, and, and that that may be part of the routine for me. But what I like to do is I like to write a song using it, and that way, I'm. I'm coming at the learning of the scale from a creative standpoint. So it's kind of a left brain versus right brain. And, and I'm kind of using both parts of my brain in that. I'm having to develop the dexterity and get the, get the finger, but I might write some kind of, you know, s s lick that's really difficult, you know, difficult. Uh, something that really highlights that, that scale um, and then try to create, try to find a chord progression, whatever. But the byproduct is a song, so you know, uh, you know, content as they say. Now I don't know that anything I've written like that would be marketable. Although a lot of my pieces of music I write for for my personal education purposes. The sun is coming out in California. We've had rain for days now. Finally, the sun's coming out. There we go. Um, and uh, those have you know. A lot of the time, a lot of my content that I have that's, you know, out there generating revenue for me, whether it be a bluegrass song in a movie or a classical piece in a, in a TV show or something, um, those were written as studies that I did. I mean, how many, eight, you know, if something's called an etude, that's just French for study, correct? Is it, it's French, right? A studio is Italian or Espanol for, for study. And there's a million pieces called studies. If you, there's some gorgeous, you know, uh, Ferdinand Soar pieces or no, for, uh, Fernando Soar pieces and Torrega and all these that all have study in front of them, but they're performed pieces. They were written as a homework assignment, but they're so good that people perform them um, in their live performances hundreds of years later. So, uh, you know, well disc, uh, well well tempered clavier was also kind of a study book. But how many times have the, has that box well tempered clavier been uh, been recorded? Uh, you know, hundreds, no doubt. So, um, so anyway, yeah. So, Rory and anyone who's like, I, if I confuse you with talking about you know flat third and third and all this stuff, don't worry. It's I'll probably restate the same thing five different ways at some point, um, and uh, you'll start to pick things up the more you hear it. Um, but when we're talking about that caged method, again, people tend to get kind of, their eyes get glazed over the whole. Caged method is, is for uh, two purposes, rhythm playing and lead playing. Okay, when I, when I solo, I'm pretty much kind of using uh, the caged method to navigate my way around the fretboard. In other words, when I play a G chord, um, it, the, the thing about the caged method is C, A, G, E, D, if you start out, if it's an E chord, then the next shape up the, the next E chord is gonna be shaped like a G chord up the fretboard. And then the next E chord is gonna be shaped um, like a, sorry, cage, uh, E, G, and then, uh, sorry, the first next A, the A chord is gonna be shaped like a G. The next G chord is gonna be shaped like uh, uh, an E. The next a G, I'm sorry, the next A chord is gonna be shaped like a D and so on and so forth. Okay, now I'm confusing myself. <laughs> Let me just demonstrate. Okay, so let's start on the E chord. Well, E is the is the second to last letter in the word caged. So just visualize the word caged. You don't have to. I can put it on the screen. I can put it on the screen right here. Let me add uh, a text thing here. All right. This is just so you can kind of see the order of the of the of the of the letters. All right, we'll just throw this down here like that. All right, try not to get on the coffee cup where you can't see it. Put it down here, like right there. All right, so if we're, if we're dealing with an E chord, the next E chord is gonna be shaped like a D chord. And then we go back to the top, the next E chord is gonna be shaped like a C chord. The next E chord is gonna be shaped like an A chord. And the next E chord is gonna be shaped like a G chord. So see those shapes all represent or look like. So we started with E and then we went to D. See, there's the D shape. Okay. And the next one was C. Look, there's a slide up to there. I'm adding a bar. Again, you don't need to be able to play these 
fairly difficult bar chords because when you're soloing, you're not playing chords, you're playing rhythm. But however, when I'm... The song's in E, I'm gonna definitely know where this... If the song's on E to A, There's a great little rhythm idea right there that works great. Or up an octave. An electric guitar or something like that. So I'm utilizing that E, uh, the D shape, to play an E chord, okay? Or you can think of it as a C shape too, but I'm kind of thinking more as a D shape. All right? So the next one after that would be A. So maybe over... Great little rhythm idea over that change. So I'm here I'm playing an E triad, E G sharp B. Don't worry, there won't be a quiz on this. And then I'm just sussing it, so I'm playing an E sus triad, but basically what I'm playing when I do that is I'm playing two-thirds of an A chord. I've got an E and an A, which are, which are part of an A triad, and then I've got a B, which makes it a, a two chord. So if I were playing E to A2, that would even fit even. Because that's, but I like, I like having that B against the C sharp. You know, you get this, you get this beautiful, that kind of sound is what's happening. But I arrived at that riff by visualizing that A shape but taking it up to the E shape. So when I'm playing over an E chord, I can go, oh, okay. A, A sharp, B flat, B, C, C sharp, D flat, D, D sharp, E flat, E. That makes sense. So the C shape up the neck, otherwise it's too many finger patterns to learn um, in one sitting. Brain gets full quick. <laughs> I mean this, oh so, okay, so this, the C shape. So you want me to show all the C chords using the five shapes. So C, okay, and then the next one is A, right? So it's the A shape, well you play A, that's not, that's not a C chord, that's an A chord. So you gotta move it up to be a, a C chord, which is there. And you can see it's connected. Look, this note and this note are the same. So it's the very next one. That's the cool thing, it actually spells out the word caged. Um, no matter where you start, it spells out the word caged. Would polywebs be, be okay on acoustic travel? Game? Oh, heck yeah. Or, yeah, polywebs would be actually almost better because when you're traveling, you don't know what the weather's going to be like. So I think it would tend to be stay a little bit more even, and it, it tends to stay in tune better, too, the polywebs. I feel like, um, oh, no, just the C shape. Okay, so here's the C shape. And then if you go up, again, this is not a, a, a chord shape that you're naturally going to grab for your hand. I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, I do. In fact, I thought about doing a video on, uh, of, uh, I saw, except I can't find it now, but I saw a, a video, what was it? It was uh, the Beatles, it was John Lennon, and for E, he played this, and for D, he played this. like whoa he grabbed that chord solidly on, on his electric I think he was playing a Rickenbacker and then for E he played this and I'm pretty sure he had the E string open. okay so this would be the C shape and if what I usually tell people to do is take the see all of these chords can be played with three fingers um, C your first three fingers A I don't usually play it like that but look I'm using my first three fingers G with my first three fingers, E with my first three fingers, and D with my first three fingers. So the pinky is left out of all these shapes. It wouldn't normally, normally I would play A like this, G I might play like this, but we can just for demonstration purposes look at those chords that way. All right, and and I'm talking about cage method in, in uh, the cage method in relationship to embellishments, fills, and riffs. Um, I mean, I could talk on the cage method for years. The um, because every one of those shapes 
comes with licks that are very natural to it. Like I said, like. That's such a natural thing to do over an E chord, but it's not particularly natural over the A chord. You have to make an A minor and then hammer on the third. I might do that, but I don't think I've ever done that. And over the G, it's impossible because the B is an open string. You could do it down here. D, you know, that would be no fun. So it's really kind of a lick, a riff that occurs almost exclusively over that E shape. So that means you have to use the E shape to use that lick. You have to find it in all the different keys. So with the C chord. So no, I'm gonna go up the neck with the C chord. Here's the C chord. Um, and there's the C shape. So what then I tell you to do is, is you got the three fingers. Okay, these three fingers are you're playing the C chord with. Play it with these three fingers. You'd be like, uh, okay. So now you gotta put your pinky there. And your and that's not easy. Actually, it's a good little exercise. You could probably practice going back and forth like that. Be a, kind of a another exercise you could do. Not that it's horribly useful. You're not going to ever need to do that. But anything you can do that gives your fingers some independence and strength is always a good thing. I find that at, the older I get, the less precise my fingers get. So I have to be a little bit more careful. I have to concentrate a little bit harder sometimes. Um, I don't have arthritis, thank God. Not yet, anyway. Now, I've never done this exercise before, so already I can kind of get it down. Okay, so if you got that, if you got that down, then you can, if you go up one fret and then bar the top three strings with your first finger, probably not easy, you may not even be able to do that, but you, you, can you visualize it? You don't have to be able to play it. Can you see, you can even put your hand on it and go, okay, I can see, well, that's C sharp. That's a C sharp chord. So any lick could be done here. Okay, and then you go up a fret to, that's D. That's when John Lennon was playing. D sharp or E flat. Here's E. Here's F. Same as that. Okay. Go up another fret, F sharp, G. And you don't necessarily have to memorize all of these, right? I'm not asking you to necessarily memorize the shapes of all the, if you memorize the, the bottom string, um, then two of these chords um, have the roots on the bottom string. So whatever is playing, whatever note is playing there, that's what chord it is. So if I play an E form at the fourth fret, that's a that's an A flat, so that's an A flat chord. If I play a G form at the fifth, fourth fret, that note there, is G's up, the root is on the bottom string, and I know that that's a B note, that's a B chord, okay? And then the same thing's true. So if you learn the bottom string and the fourth, fifth string, uh, you're really 90% there because uh, the A chord and the C chord are both based on the fifth string. So if you know this is A and you know that's B, then you know this is a B chord, you know that this is E flat, then this is E flat chord. If this is G, then this is a G chord, okay? And same thing with the C chord. If you know that's a C and this is a C note, Whatever note that is with the C shape, that's there's E flat, there's E, there's F sharp, there's A. Okay, so, oh Sam, uh, demonstrate how one shape is connected by the roots, the bottom root of the shape and the top root of the next shape. Um, <clears throat> so, the kind of what I was talking about, right Sam? I mean, if we were to spell out the the um so the next yeah i'm not exactly sure oh my favorite composer for um uh but a, a film or or classical composer i think either would be hard So, so demonstrate how the one shape is connected by the roots. So here's the root of this shape. Here's the bottom root of this shape, this shape. And then D, the D shape is there. But if you want to visualize that F sharp in the bottom there, you get a you get a six string version, just like with the C chord, you can, and the A chord. I mean, we can turn all of these into six string 
um, chords to visualize them up and down the neck so we're not just limiting ourselves to, to, to uh, four strings when we're doing the D shape. So Brian, you can do that. And so what I'm really what I'm visualizing is the note here. Okay. So I've I've obviously memorized all my strings. But if you start with the bottom two strings, memorizing, and don't do the sharps and flats yet. Okay. I here I could tell you the the trick that I tell people beginners first lesson stuff. This is first lesson right here, and when I was teaching. Um, there's a half step between E and F and a half step between B and C. Everything else is a whole step. What that means on the guitar is a half step is one fret and a whole step is two frets. So if this is the E string, and I usually teach them the names of the strings, E, A, D, G, B, E, which is eat at Denny's, get bad eggs. All right? Let's say dead, dead composer. Uh, I like Villobos, but I, I, I like... Um, uh, I mean, I hate to be so generic, but to say Bach, I mean, Bach was, I don't even know how he did it, Mozart and Beethoven, I mean, it's, it's great. But I like Mahler. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. That's funny that you asked me that because I've been listening to classical radio now in the car, so that's what my radio is tuned to for the last three or four months, maybe longer. I feel like there's a real... A hole in my musical knowledge when it comes to classical music. So I decided, nah, every time I'm in the car, which isn't very often, I probably put 5,000 miles on my car last year, but every time I'm in my car, um, I, uh, I'm i hearing classical music and probably 75% of the time I've never heard the piece before. So I'm always taking pictures of what it is and, oh, that's kind of cool. Uh, play some Mahler, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't play. If I had music in front of me, I could play it. Um, there's not a lot of Mahler classical guitar play. Uh, uh, you know, Isaac, if you talk about classical or guitar composers, you know, like Isaac Albanese, you know. I'm playing it too fast, but um, uh, yeah, or, you know, but Bach, you know. Great melodies. It's not very actually. <laughs> uh, I yeah, it was probably so. Check out my interview with Joe DeBlasi. I just watched it with my cousin because we were watching the the. Uh, I went to Phoenix to see my cousin who gave me his tailor here, and um, he um, uh, he'd never seen the. He loves music and he loves music videos and stuff. He'd never seen the. Uh, uh, oops. Oh, okay. I'll do that later. All right. So I need YouTube. Um, and I also showed him my interview with my friend Joe DeBlasi, um, who is not a member of the Wrecking Crew, but Tommy Tedesco, who was kind of one of the uh, founding members of the Wrecking Crew. Um, he... Uh, no, I don't, I can't, uh, so frustrating. I can't, I can't watch. Okay, here we go. I'm trying to say, sorry, I'm just trying to come in. All right. So, um, Joe, I did an interview with Joe and it's, it's actually really, we had a good time. Um, I'd like, I got to do more of these. I've got a couple of other, you know, several other people I could interview. I just haven't gotten around to it. Um, and this, this video doesn't even have a thousand views. So, oh, I'm blurry. Come and focus on me. Sorry, the camera sometimes does that. And then bring it this way. 
still still kind of blurry. See if it adjusts. Um, it's not adjusting. What's your problem? There we go. Come on, stay with it. There we go. That seems right. Um, so uh, he he played guitar on all. He's the guitar player on all the Charo records. So probably she she is phenomenal at finger syncing. <laughs> <laughs> but live, I think it's him actually playing it, even that, you know, recording. So, uh, so yeah, Charo probably can play it, but performance level, no, that was probably Joe. Joe's a phenomenal guitar player. In fact, he, he brings out his, in that interview, he brings out the Ramirez that he bought when he was 19 years old. He went to Spain as a 19-year-old to the Ramirez factory specifically for the purpose of buying a Ramirez. Um, and maybe maybe he got a deal or something because he went right to the factory and he didn't have to deal with a distributor and all that stuff. Um, but super smart, he still uses that guitar. Um, and he used that guitar on, uh, he wrote uh, the song. Uh, oh, that's right, it's, it's, that's it. He wrote that on the on the Pink Floyd the Wall record and never never got credit for it. In fact, they even they uh, oh thank you uh, Captain Stubing. <laughs> yeah yeah um, that he never he never got credit. He they actually spelled his name wrong on the album. <laughs> so, uh, Tony Tennille sang on that album from Captain and Tennille. Yeah, it's interesting to look at the credits on that record. It's you know Joe Picaro and Jeff Picaro, father and son drummers played on that record. Uh, Joe Picaro, I think, is still alive and still playing on The Simpsons. I think he's done all 33 seasons of The Simpsons or something. It's un unbelievable. Um, so I've gotten way off my my original point. You got me on co composers. Um, so the, the, um, the cage method, um, it, again, it's just a way of visualizing the fretboard, and it kind of unlocks it when you start to see C, A, G, D, e, D shapes. You start to see them up and down the neck, and when I'm soloing, like if I'm playing over a C chord, I might be... that was you know some of it I'm, I'm seeing pentatonic shape so not only am I seeing the chords but I'm, I'm, I've learned over the years the different corresponding pentatonic scales the minor pentatonic scales the major scales the Dorian scales and all of that so that when I'm visualizing all the C shapes up down the neck I can see all the corresponding scales so for example if I'm here and I'm visualizing the G shape the C scale here If I want a Dorian sound, if I'm playing over like a C7, or I want pentatonic, uh, or if I want minor pentatonic, if I want to play kind of a minor bluesy sound to, over this, but all of it's based around this C, this. G form, the great thing about it is it completely transposable. So let's say I'm playing in the key of uh, B flat, and I, there's my B flat major pentatonic, there's my B flat major uh, major scale, B flat Dorian or Mixolydian, uh, B flat minor pentatonic, B flat uh, minor blues. So all of that is, is when you learn one thing on the guitar, you've really learned 12 things if it doesn't use open strings. Different, different story if, it, if there's an open string involved. But if there's no open string in a scale you've learned, say you learn a scale from a song, and you're like, oh, okay, I got that. Well, now you really technically know 12 scales. That's one of the beauties of the guitars. Guitar, I think guitar is one of the hardest instruments to master uh, because there's... It's prevalent in so many genres that I don't think there's ever been someone who's technically mastered all the genres. Guthrie Govan has probably come as close as anyone. Um, but, uh, you know, I would consider 
uh, Andre Segovia, uh, a, ma uh, a master, um, though he couldn't play jazz or bebop or uh, rock or blues or country or any of those. He could just play classical, maybe some flamenco, uh, but mainly classical. But he he created the entire um, technique for classical. You know, when we to this day, we'll, you know, we still you learn you learn Segovia skills if you study classical guitar. Because he kind of developed the most efficient way to play two and three octave scales. So that's Andre Segovia. Now that's not normally how I play scales, uh, but I might utilize some Andre Segovia t scale type movements. But I probably won't go all the way up to there necessarily if I'm in the middle of a solo or something. So, um, okay. When playing major bar chords up and down the neck, use the vowels. Uh, the consonants are difficult. Using the A shape and the E shape. Yeah, right. Sam's actually right. The, 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 the two, two main uh, bar chords that everybody pretty much needs to know if they're going to get very far on guitar at all is going to be the E form and the A form. The G, G, C, and D are not necessary. The, the, the funny thing, though, I did, like I said, I did notice that John Lennon back in the 60s was I think playing that shape for D, and then this for E. And I think he just liked the sound of that voice. I'm not sure what it would be. Uh, I love them. Uh, probably. Yeah. Probably how he came up. I mean, because I, I think that lick is in that song. At some point, I hear somebody doing it, and it's probably the only way you can do it. Yeah, I mean, I can't. Actually, Hendrix would have played it like that. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's so funny. So, but uh, Sam is exactly right. The main, the main two bar chords you're gonna you're gonna use, and they they will get you really far. Um, is the E form, which is taking the E chord again. I played all five of those shapes with these three fingers. So substitute these three fingers. So play E like this. Not easy, but what that is. Sometimes I'll play E like that if I'm gonna. So that my hand's already in the shape of the bar chord. So, because if I go from A down to this and make this shape, then I've got to move, then all these fingers have to swap out to go to this chord. So, if I just leave them like that, then I play E like this. Now, I can't really do any embellishments because my first, my pinky's not available, but, but that may not be what you're doing. You may just want big bar chords. So, yeah, so, Brian, I wouldn't necessarily, or whoever's wondering, I wouldn't necessarily try to master the C-shaped bar chord up here yet. I would concentrate on the E and the A, okay? Because that will get you, like I said, that will get you pretty far. Here's E and here's E. Here's A and here's A. So you got an E, uh, so like F would be a better example. F chord here and an F chord up here. So you got two options there. Now, I might grab that one honest. I doubt I'd grab that one, and I definitely won't grab this one, but I might grab that. So knowing that those shapes exist up and down is, is important, uh, because if I were to play, let's say, uh, B flat, all right, um, I might play it like that. I might play it like, I might not play it like this necessarily, but I might play, play the bottom two notes of that G shape. And I, I came, I came, I came to knowing that by visualizing the G shape. Okay, this is the G shape. Put your lights, put your lights on. Just play, put your, oh, play, put your lights on. I don't know that song. So you can see I'm just using the snippet, or I, I might even do. 
See, I'm just visualizing this whole chord, this G shape, moved up three frets to the B flat. All right? I might visualize that um, for the purpose of playing a little rhythm. Something like that might be something that I would come up with because I'm visualizing this shape. Um, and I'm talking about rhythm playing. So I'm not banging out. A lot of times when you're playing rhythm, there's another guitar player, and you got to come up with an idea that's almost soloistic. Or maybe even over a Jackson 5 kind of vibe. I'm just playing the B flat and the B flat. Over, and somebody else is playing this chord, or maybe their capo just playing a G shape. But So that's kind of the value of even not just being able to visualize all five shapes up and down the neck. But Sam's right, the main ones you're going to want to learn are the E shapes, the ones that look like the E chord. And that gets you memorizing the bottom string. And the ones shaped like an A chord, which gets you memorizing the fifth string. And once you have those two strings down, it makes it a lot easier to, you know, it makes it a lot easier to to find and learn and to name out chords in power chord songs, you know? Uh. I don't know what he does there. What does he do there? No. No. It's, it's that song when that song hit the radios you're like whoa it was one of the first songs that heavily used samplers the orchestra hits and the, uh, the the guitar licks and things like that a lot of that stuff was played on samplers so it probably was a making of behind the scenes uh, of uh, of that song or a de description making of There's something. Trevor Horn, track breakdown. Oh, original. Okay, see, that's exactly what I want right there. That's cool. Three years ago. This should be pretty good. Sound on Sound Magazine. Okay, so this should be a pretty good video. It's 21 minutes. Uh, heck, I'll just, I'm not going to watch it, but cool. um, I can share it. Not. <laughs> I don't know if any of you are interested in that, but I remember that when that record came out, it was groundbreaking. Um so let's see what time is it all right we we are going to have a guest today for the end of the of this live stream a uh, ben there somewhere on what song uh see uh gurus always teach uh cage as chord focused in uh, here's a C chord here's a C chord in a shape yes too overwhelming for me I have a I have a lot of quit in me laugh out loud yeah <laughs> yeah Brian um, yeah and I'm not um, it's kind of one of those things where if you use it you'll use it um, for example Brian if you're a bluegrass player you, most everything you're going to need to know is going to be down here and you'll see you know when bluegrass players play in the key of A they just they just capo and they still play in the key of G. So all their memory, muscle memory stuff. All that stuff that they did in G works in A. So it, that doesn't really... Um, so a lot of players don't necessarily, if you're just a, you know, banging out uh, open chord songs or if you're a worship leader and then you go, you're playing in the key of B and then you go to, you know, the, a lot of times they'll just, every, every song they play will be using G shapes. Um, so let's see, um, I've got to save this to watch later because I'm not going to have time to watch it today. All right. Um, Thank you. 
So that's that's not unusual. And technically, you're using the cage method when you do this, though, because this is you're playing a G shape. Well, that's a B chord. So if you wanted to play a B chord without the capo, you could potentially play it like that. Not the best way to play it. Like Sam said, the main ones are the A's and the and the um, and the E's. So. Yeah, and it basically there's two there's two words being used at the same time when I when I talk about caged method. I'm talking about chord and shape or form. I'll say A form, which I mean A shape. Uh, so the A form, this is the A form up and down the neck, but it's a different chord. So that's an A form C chord. It looks like an A chord, but it's really a C chord. So you can see the A form move up. And or I might say the word A shape. Sometimes I just interchange those and that may make it more confusing and I apologize I don't mean to do that I'm not but different people use the term shape and some people use the term form so it's good to know both of those uh, can we get some more blue <laughs> I don't know what I was playing at. And we did a whole series on bluegrass we learned a bunch of bluegrass songs um, on the live stream. So if you go back, you go to my live stream and go back to 2020, I think, or what was it? Somebody asked me, what do you want to work on? I said, I'd love to work on my bluegrass chops. So I said, well, let's do it together. So we kind of did it together. Um, and I wrote some bluegrass songs. Funny, you know, we came up with some funny names for them. Um, but one of the things you want to do with like bluegrass, and this, this comes into chord embellishment, fills and riffs. We've talked about this before. Um, is you want it like on the G chord, particularly G, because you're going to be in the key of G so often, and so so much bluegrass is built on the one, the four, and the five chord, which would be G one, A B C four, D five. That is a pretty standard blues progression. When, if you go to my uh, blues jam track, which has hundreds of thousands of views, I have multiple blues jam tracks for different tempos. Um, if you go to that, you can practice even strumming along with it if you want. Um, a lot of people just do that. They work on like, oh, I'm picking up mandolin, so I want to learn those chords, and I'll do that. I'll, I just pulled it up the other day, and I was just working on my mandolin triads over that and my mandolin seventh chords and things like that over my recording and I pulled it up on YouTube so I because I have the recording I could just listen to it but I'd rather pull it up on YouTube so I make the millionth of a penny for watching it anyway um, so what you want to do is you want to learn a bunch of different scales in the key of G in open position you want to learn a G major scale you can google G major scale and they'll tell you what the notes are you can even google G major scale on guitar and it might show you open, you could even enter the word open position. Oops. Uh, now, you probably should also know the notes that here's G and then F sharp and E just so you have that option because you, you, you want to be able to know that those notes exist. So don't just learn there. And then you might go up, up the E string a little bit too. You could learn like the G major pentatonic, which is a five note scale. That's why it's called pentatonic, five sides. I mean, I can just play with my second finger all day long. pentatonic you can add that flat third in there to give it kind of a pseudo blues sound and that's where that bluegrass lick comes from third fret on the bottom string and open a first fret second fret and then open D second fret on the D which is E and back to open D and then hit the open G 
uh, it, the timing now is a bump, ba da 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 da. You could even, like, you could even tap it out on ratty jeans. I need to buy some jeans. <laughs> Getting that. I'm running. Uh, bump, ba da 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 da. And that's. You can do it over the C. Learn it over all three chords if you want to have that. That's that's like the stereotypical bluegrass ending. Um, but then, you know, you can come up with the variations on it too. Okay, so you learn the major scale, the major pentatonic, the major blues. You can learn the minor pentatonic. And that has notes that clash, but it sounds so good. Because it kind of has a bluesy sound to it. Kind of puts the blues in bluegrass. Um, and that, you learn those, so you can you could Google G minor pentatonic. And then you can do G minor blues. So that would be, let's see. And when you, you know, you get those scales, you just kind of... Take that jam track that you know I have, and then go you know, do the work on blues. And maybe I always say do snippets, do two two strings of it. Get little pieces of it down. That's how you get faster. Start with a little piece, and then add a piece, and then add a piece, and then add another note. You know, whatever, keep, keep adding notes until you can do the whole scale fast. Um, and then another scale you might learn would be the G Mixolydian, which is a G major scale. Instead of an F sharp, play an F natural, which works great over G7. Works great over G7, but it works fine over just straight old, uh, straight old G. So that's G mixolydian. So let me, uh, let me. I'm not going to tab them out or anything, but I'm going to, I'm going to write the names here. So you have the list of G scales, G major scale, uh, G mixolydian. Oops, mixolydian. G major pentatonic, G, I don't know, I don't know what that's called when you add that flat third. I call it like a G major blues pentatonic. I don't know what happens if you Google that. Pentatonic, uh, G, uh, what else did I say? Uh, G minor pentatonic. And then uh, G blues, G minor blues. You can just say G blues, but... Oops, mino, mino. <laughs> G minor blues. And that's what, five major mixolydian, major pentatonic, no, uh, six different scales. And then, then learn them in C as well. So you you know you you get them all you know G major. And then you learn C major, which by the way is the same as G mixolydian. And don't forget to go all the way down to give yourself as many notes as possible. You, know, you can even work on chromatic skills. Which chromatic is just every note. That's a chromatic skill. Comes in real handy. Uh, Little, little snippet chromatic you know. You do that with, you can visualize, again, this is a perfect example. Like here I'm visualizing 
the C form G chord. This is a G chord, but it's a C form. And I'm, I'm gonna go chromatically to every one of these notes and it creates a really cool little riff. I'm gonna go underneath by a whole step and go up. There's that one. Then this one. Then this one. So I'm landing on these notes. And I'm landing on those notes with my third finger. So if you want to just go. And I'm going. Totally works. Go. Almost kind of a Django Reinhardt trick. He would do that, except he would go around it. <laughs> so if you've seen it, he would take each note and go. go chromatically one note above one fret above and one fret below sorry I keep looking at the names or I mean the tech the uh, chat or my screen and I don't look at the camera enough I should move the camera over here that makes makes more sense if I move the camera there what are you gonna see though well, that's the same stuff behind me a lot of crap <laughs> a lot of guitars <laughs> a lot of weird instruments back there yeah, a lot of weird instruments. Um, so, yeah, and, and Ken, if you're watching, thanks so much for this guitar. It's such a beautiful guitar. It's going to get used very, a lot. I might use it today on the on the TV show I'm working on. Um, uh, the TV show doesn't have a name yet, so it's just... Uh, we did the pilot a couple weeks ago in the first episode, or second episode. Now we're doing the third and fourth episode today. Today, uh, we're doing all the guitar sports, so... My friend Jim Cavell is coming over, and he said he's going to wear a funny hat. And I said, oh, so you're going to wear a USC cap? <laughs> hey, David, what's going on? Uh, oh. <laughs> Bruce, good morning. Good morning. Uh, so, uh, Dennis, I, I, so is it guten, guten Avant? Is that what you say? You're in, Nether in the Netherlands. Do you say that? Is that what you say at night? Good evening. Is that how you say good evening? Good Avant. Is that? Am I am I blending German with French? <laughs> Type it out for me so I can see it. Dennis is one of our administrators, and he's in. So we've got administrators on the east. Now I, I haven't seen uh, Holly at all. Is she here? Did I miss her? Did I not? Where are the ladies today? Have we had any ladies? Or is it just Sam? I'm kidding today. Guys. See, we, it's funny because guys, when guys get together, we brutalize each other. You know, we just like make fun of each other. Everything like, It just rolls right off. Because women don't understand that. Like they, they hang out with guys and like, gosh, you guys are so mean to each other. I'm like, are we? <laughs> We're all like best friends. Well, I see Wendy's there. Okay. Oh, uh, Brad's here. I didn't see you, Brad. Sorry. Totally, totally not ignoring you. Dennis, there's Dennis. Did Dennis tell me how to say it back, way back when? Gusevon. Jan, Gusevon. Good morning. Good avant. Good avant, everyone. So I was close. Good avant. Good avant. Something like that. Yeah, and feel free to subscribe. Like, we do this... Every Monday, I try to be here. We used to, when COVID dropped, we did it for, was it 62 days in a row? We did it every day. Wendy's here. Exactly. You don't mind being mean. Well, yeah, I know mean girls. <laughs> I, I, seem to, I seem to attract them in high school. It was like, dang it. I was like, ah, I never had confidence in high school. I just didn't. Guna Vaughn. So I was pretty good. Yeah. Thanks, John. Pretty close. But yeah, it's a it's a good community. Most of these people are on the Discord too, hanging out and talking guitar and shop and whatever, talking life. Um, just be cool, don't be a troll, um, and uh, you know, support each other. Um, I mean, you can be honest. If someone's singing a song and, and they're playing in G and they're singing in A flat, you might want to let them know. <laughs> so, but you know, at the same time, this is the community, a building up community. I I I really do try to encourage. Um, probably to a fault. I mean, I told you about that t student I had. His name was Tom. I won't say his last name, but his name was Tom as well. And he was awful. 
and he just would not learn anything. And he was a scientist. He worked at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab, and he could not get guitar. He had this, almost like this snail tendency, like he would just, like to make a C chord, it was like, and for years, I mean, he took lessons from me for years. And I think he just, I, I even told him, I said, I don't think guitar's your thing. And he just said, no, I want to keep taking lessons. And he never got it down. And, he, you know, ten, it was back then I was charging $10 an hour or something for guitar lessons. So mm -hmm. I think he just wanted the contact and he wanted to help me out financially because I was a struggling, starving musician. So, I mean, but I haven't had many students like that that just stuck it out, you know, when it was like, <laughs> especially, it, you'd have to be pretty bad for a poor musician like me at the time to say, you know, maybe this isn't your thing. <laughs> Usually what I did was I would spend the lesson trying to figure out, okay, maybe if I taught him this. In fact, it was probably Tom that got me to learn how to teach things from many different directions. It was probably huge for me as a creating my pedagogy because uh, he just couldn't, you know, it was just like C chord was like, dude, just put the fingers down at the same time <laughs> and you'd be like, okay. And I would be like, you know, pull my hair out. And I had long hair back then. I would pull my hair out. <laughs> Django's great. Oh, I love Django. I'm I'm actually a, a quarter French and like a quarter Bohemian, which doesn't really exist, but Bohemia was like Czech half of the Czech Republic and half of Austria back over a hundred years ago. And um and so I kind of have that gypsy French thing. It's just that music resonates with me. Uh, the thing about gypsy jazz is, and I'll just show you a chord right now that is, immediately sounds like gypsy jazz. If you play this chord, it just immediately sounds like gypsy jazz. So it's a minor sixth chord, but all you have is the root, the third, and the sixth. There's no fifth in it. And so I'm playing, put your second finger, this would be a G minor sixth. Put your second finger on the G note, third fret of the bottom string, okay? And then you're going to deaden the next string with the, with the, the fleshy part of your second string, okay? Second, second finger, sorry. And then put your first finger on the fourth string at the second fret, and then put your third finger also on the third fret of the third string. And then you're gonna wanna deaden everything. So you just want those three notes to ring out. So however you deaden, um, or just not, just kinda aim for the bottom four strings, and then, you know, maybe deaden the, uh, maybe deaden the E string with the side of your first finger, but, if you did like bass chord, bass like an oompa thing, move up to C. And technically here, when you play this, you're kind of implying a D7 chord, but you're putting a fifth in the bass. It's like a minor blues. Third fret. 8th fret, and I'm talking about the 2nd finger, 3rd fret, 5th fret, 3rd fret, 8th fret, 3rd fret, 5th fret, okay, and that, this is great, and then, then you just learn a bunch of like, oh, like minor 6 arpeggios, a great way to kind of get started on the gypsy sound. Or minor ninth. Play that ninth. Or the sixth. The sixth and the ninth are the ones, the two notes you really want to kind of um, gravitate towards. And then that, that chromatic thing that Django would do, he would do like this, uh, just to visualize a G minor chord, he would visualize the top three strings of a G minor triad. Okay, right there, third fret, top three strings. Where you go? You could do chromatic where I'm going one fret up and one fret down. But those notes are kind of weird, I like them. Any of those words. And 
he mastered this thing because he only had two fingers. So he would probably play it like. Like that, where he'd slide the first finger and get the. And, but he mastered this thing where he could play like. The chromatic scale with one finger and just time it perfectly. Like it would sound like he was literally going, you know, like. You can practice that. You know, try to do, try to get there in, is that, that's 13 hits. So you should end up with a downstroke. 13 hits. Yeah. You know, but he, he got it down. It sounded like he was doing... Uh, it's amazing. I mean, we, you know, he was already a, a pretty good guitar player before he lost his two fingers. And so he didn't give it up. That's, I mean, he, for me, he's a testimony of stick to -itiveness. So... A great exercise for alternate picking. Yeah, it is actually. That's not a bad a bad way to practice your. Alt I mean, you can just sit there on one note. You know, you really work in the right hand, right? But you need to be able to do alternate picking. You know, like all sorts of different ways. I, I there was a guitar player that lived in our building who was a master's. No, got his doctorate in guitar at USC, and he he had come up with these exercises that just kept going and going and going. It was like this long scale thing where it would, it would pretty much have every possible com fingering combination of notes of four note phrases, um, all the combinations, all in one, you know, like, I don't know if it went through the circle of fifths and went through every key or something. Why it just, just kept going and going, but it would like, sometimes you'd have to stretch out and sometimes you would be, you know, four frets and sometimes you'd be out to five frets. But it was the picking thing was like, you you know, you need to be able to do like alternating picking on one string and then on two strings. But you also be able to need, need to be able to play one note on one string and three notes on the next. So. And that's a little bit boring, so it's better to have like a some kind of melody that you can use, some kind of riff you can use. Uh, when you do it, you can even do like a. Uh, see, I'm gonna. What I figured. You know, where you come up with a little m melody to help you work that picking alternating thing. You can also do. I used to do. Um, this is an exercise. I think I did a video on this, the string skipping exercise, where you just take the pentatonic scale. We're way off chord embellishments, fills, and riffs, aren't we? Um, take the. But all of this has to do with the execution of chord embellishments, fills, and riffs, okay? Oh, yeah. That's such a great scale, because it starts with a half step and ends with a half step. So technically, if you listen to that whole scale, so it'll be, um, it's a no, it's, it's got a chromatic scale built into it. Um, but uh, what was I saying? Oh, the, the string skipping exercise. So you take this pentatonic scale that you know and love, that we the first one we learned, the minor pentatonic in A, and you just play it like this. Play the bottom two strings. You can do the next two. And you go to the next two strings. And then the next two. Oh, is Jim here? I don't know. Right? But then what you do is you go fifth, uh, six string to four string. And practice that. And that really is almost more of an exercise for your right hand. It's very similar to this on the left hand, except you're skipping a string. And then you go to the next. 
that, and then you go to the next, and the next. Oh, there's Jim. All right, hold on a second. I'll be right back. I got wax all up in my face. All right, so everybody, this is uh, Jim Jim Cavell here. Uh, let's see, he's gonna sit behind me. I should try to move this microphone because I, I mean the camera because I keep feeling like, of course now it's not gonna. I keep feeling like I'm staring too often at the. Of course now I can't see Jim at all. <laughs> so, we'll leave it here for now. I'll deal with it later. I'll figure it out this week. Okay. There's Jim. Everybody say hi, Jim. Where are you? Here's here's my here's my question. Where's the camera? <laughs> yeah. Right. Why are you people listening to him? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm gonna stand behind him. Say faster, <laughs> or funnier. Faster. <laughs> is that your funny hat? <laughs> my funny hat. Well, it says music, music by. by. <laughs> That's, right. That's funny. That yeah, is a funny hat. Yeah. Jim and I have known each other for 35 years. No. We're only, we were when we were teenagers. We were we were newborns. Te newborns. Yeah, we in were the nursery. We, we were in the same nursery together back in the in the sixties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. No, I've known you since uh, since we started going to Lake Avenue, which was right when we got married. Right. You were part of Genesis back. Then. Yeah. Yeah. So we yeah. were in the same bi we were in the same Sunday school class at Lake Avenue Church in Pasadena for for a while uh, until I got a job at a different church, but um, we were there most weekends. And um, Jim was, I think, the first composer I ever worked for. Maybe Tom Howard was before. Right, uh, but um, you played on American Detective with me, I think. Yeah, well, and I've talked about that. American Detective was a show that um, uh, Jim called me for, and he put me on second guitar, but I was on every episode, which was nice, because the first guitar was a rotating position. So I got to work with Michael Thompson and Grant Geisman and John Gu and Dean Parks, four of the top session guys in town, and I got to I got to realize that uh, yeah I'm not good enough. Uh, <laughs> no, I remember I was doing we were doing because every episode was in a different city, so Jim was writing music kind of based on the sonics of that city. So we were doing one that took place I guess in Texas, and we were doing kind of a, a ZZ Top vibe, right? right. It was and then, an easy top thing. Yeah, and then there was another one. I think it was New Orleans, and I brought my lap steel. Right. And so I was playing lap my lap steel, and um, I was there early, see, because I didn't have cartage. All the other guitar players had cartage, which means they had guys <laughs> come and set up their gear before they got there. Uh, but I didn't have that. And in fact, I think the cartridge guys made more than I did on those sessions. Yeah, but you had a car. That was good. I had a car, so that's all yeah. I need to do cartage. And um, I uh, was playing some lap steel stuff, and Michael Thompson walks into the control room, and he asked them if they were listening to a Ry Cooter record. And, ah. <laughs> and I thought that, I was like, that's like the highest praise you can give a, a lap steel guy. Yeah. Um, is if he, that he sounds like Ry Cooter. So. Uh, well, and they were listening to a Ry Cooter record. That's what they were. <laughs> it wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't me. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it was... Uh, it was pretty, pretty, pretty fun doing those. I mean, I was, it was pretty nerve wracking. I still have those charts from those sessions. Really? Yeah, I kept. Okay. I yeah. used, I used to keep charts from all sessions because I wanted to practice my sight reading and pull them out. And a lot of the cues were really short. Yeah, fast. You know. Faster on sight reading. Faster on exactly. Sight reading. <laughs> I've been. Oh man, I'm doing so much sight reading right now. Look at all this. This is just. This is just from this week. This is just. Well, I think some of this is from our last session, but. Yeah, that's our last session right there. But holy cow. And this is just from the last couple days. <laughs> All that reading. Look at that. This is a lot of music. 
Love one it. Eander, two eander, one eander, three eander. Oh, it's just, yeah. Thomas, just getting good at that now. I'm just starting to nail it. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, on that note, oh, let's see what people are saying. Uh, hi, Jim from Good Karma GPS. Let's see. Uh, jo Joseph says hi, Jim. Uh, hi, Joe. Let's see. Who else is? Yeah, not always bad being the worst in the room. That's a, oh, oh, of course, now we're peaking. It's like now we've got 39 viewers. We, we were down in the 20s. Now all of a sudden we're up in the 30s, high 30s. Um, got to run. Okay, Sam's taking off. Let's see. Uh, -bum. Yeah, Joe said, hey, Jim. Joe, uh, another Joe said, hey, Jim, hey, man. Sam Stamos in Michigan said, hey, Jim. Sam Stamos is a big Michigan University fan. All right. He was very disappointed by the finals there. Uh, let's see. Play something together. Oh, you know what? He doesn't have a piano here. So right. that's his instrument. So anyway, on, on that high note, we're going to take off. Uh, we're we're going to get to work here. we got some work to do. We're going to do a couple TV shows. And um, I will see you all next Monday. God bless you and be safe. Take care. Bye-bye.